Some of the concepts um, in this discussion about the internet seem to be borrowed from the physical world. Uh, we talk about sometimes web servers as uh, printing presses, uh, we talk about ISPs as uh, postal services, and uh, we talk about file sharing as stealing or, or as piracy. Um, and one political dogma that we hear a lot in Sweden is that the same rules that apply outside of the internet should also apply on the internet. Uh, you seem to say, or at least imply, that this kind of language and the attempts to shape the internet into a copy of the old physical world is not really beneficial, but rather something that limits the way that we can use technology. So my question is, is it even humanly possible, though, to discuss and to talk about this new thing without referring to the old world and the old concepts that we understand? No, it's, it's not going to be possible to understand it, except in relationship to the stuff we're familiar with. And the stuff we're familiar with is the schemes of regulation that we had in real space. Um, but I think what the examples of history teach is that it's not the first time that we've had to translate architectures of regulation from one context to another. So that was the point about the way wiretapping had to eventually be rolled into the protections of privacy that the Constitution granted by recognizing that if you applied the same rules in the same way, you would not achieve the same results because you wouldn't be protecting privacy in perhaps the most important way in the, in the even telephone age. So, so I'm not disagreeing with um, the claim that we need to keep something the same, but I am saying that we need to be facile enough with the technology to recognize how it changes the particular rules that need to be applied quite significantly. So the same objective of copyright law needs to exist in real space and in digital space. That objective is to create incentives that are necessary for certain forms of creativity. But how you create those incentives is obviously, right, this is, this is I always feel like, it, like I'm just saying the most obvious point, yet nobody in the United States Congress seems to understand it. Obviously, the way to produce that same set of objectives is going to be radically different if the platform is radically different, and that's what digital technologies are. Let's try this. Uh, how can one culture be both read-only and read-write? Right, so in the way that our culture increasingly is, in the sense that um, unlike the um, 19th century, an extraordinary amount of what we, how we experience culture is culture that was designed just to be consumed. Right? So films that are, we go to the theater to watch, or um, uh, record albums or CDs that we buy that are designed to be just listened to, These, or even books, which are designed just to be read. An extraordinary range of this is culture that we just experience as culture to be, to be read alone. Um, but the difference from the 20th century to the 21st century, or every century before the 20th century and the 20th century, is that we also increasingly have people who want, who are able, enabled, to do stuff with the culture designed just to be read. Um, and that's the read-write part. And, and it, the point is to recognize it's not either or in a culture, it's both. And of course, every culture has a little bit of both. But the distinction of the, about the 20th century, this bizarrely weird century in the history of human culture, is that it was the most enforced passive century for the consumption of culture. And we began to take for granted um, a passive relationship to culture. Now, this is a little bit of an American point. I, you know, my, my wife is, is German, came from Germany, and, and they experience culture differently from the way an American does. So they, on Christmas, we get together and we sing songs around the Christmas tree. It strikes an American as bizarre. You know, you should turn the CD player on and listen to, you know, good song singing. That's why you celebrate, you listen to, fan but the idea that, you know, sit at the piano and sing songs is kind of crazy. So I'm not saying that, you know, all cultures are equally infected by this. And indeed, the developing world is radically different in this sense. They understand that much of the culture that they are experiencing is culture they're creating because they don't have the infrastructure to actually um, spend all of the time watching television or going to, to movies. Um, but we need to see how both of these can 
can simultaneously exist? And what's the way to encourage both to exist um, uh, without destroying the incentives to produce important read-only culture and destroying the freedom that I think culture needs to build upon that in the read-write way that I described? Yeah, um, you know, the, the, the bizarre fact about it is that, at least in the Anglo-American tradition, for most of the history of, quote, copyright law, it has not regulated a, quote, copy. Right? So the copyright law originally regulates publishing and printing. Um, it doesn't regulate copying in the sense of sitting down and copying out a poem from some book that's not subject to the regulation. And when the word in the 19, uh, early 1900s in the United States, the statute includes the word copy, it's originally a mistake in the statute. But it begins to talk about this separate activity called copying. But even then, nobody was you know, prosecuting kids who copied out poems in their you know, school. Um, the technologies for copying were relatively little. Nobody had to worry about it. But as mechanical reproduction grows in the 20th century, the copyright lawyers say, oh, well, here's a copy, so this is obviously to be regulated. And you know, it's, a, it's a certain skill or blindness of lawyers that they're not able to distinguish different things. They want to see everything as the same. So as it began to manifest to include you know, people taking cassette tapes and making copies of music in their house to people using digital technologies to do anything, it seems obvious that the scope of the regulation should be increasing as the technology increases. Um, now, it's a, just a play on the words of copyright that it sounds like it's topping up, co talking about what we usually mean by the word copy. Because the word copy in copyright is not referring to making a copy. It's referring to the thing that is the, the copy of a book, uh, the copy in the sense of the thing that was used to produce the book. Um, and, and, that's, and that's just you know, a meaning that we've lost. We've just ignored that subtlety. And so we've got into this world where it seems natural to be regulating every time that someone makes a copy. And the point is that normal people, not trained in the law, need to come in and say there's something insane about this objective of regulation. It could make sense in a totalitarian regime that the idea is every time we make a copy, we're going to have to have permission from somebody. But in a free society, um, we ought to be living uh, with the presumption that the scope of regulation of you know, our relationship to culture should be as thin as necessary to create the incentives culture needs. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Per Strandberg. I'm the spokesperson for the Swedish games industry. Uh, Professor Lessig, thank you. You spent a large proportion of your speech on remix culture and how current uh, copyright legislation limits uh, the creativity in remix culture. I think it would be fair to say, though, that uh, most professional content producers are more concerned with uh, the unauthorized distribution of their work in, in its original form without any remix or change or added creativity. Um, and um, you, you seem to, you, you do agree that there is a need for copyright protection of some kind for this uh, professional uh, uh, creativity. But um, the question then becomes how, how should that um, be protected? What kind of protection is that? What's the status of that? You mentioned the collective licenses, etc. Those licenses are still a kind of, of rule set. And what happens if those rules are broken? What should be the sanction? Because it seems that currently the, the tools of the regulators are rather blunt. Uh, the current legislation might, might not fix, current or future legislation might not fix the problem. Um, it's national, whereas the internet is global. There are side effects, etc. So if, if uh, this war on piracy or other kinds of legislation is not the answer, then what is? Yeah, so um, I completely agree that uh, the main concern of copyright holders is the distribution, unauthorized distribution of whole copies that substitutes the market. But it's not the case that the law has 
tried to narrow itself to that problem. In the United States, there's one company, Viacom, that has adopted the position that if any of their content is remixed on YouTube, it won't touch it. But they're the exception. People systematically take videos that kids have made for completely non-commercial purposes, you know, remixing a sound uh, track with some you know, series of pictures or anything, and they will issue notice and takedowns uh, against that, even though the music that's being remixed couldn't in any potential uh, way substitute for the market that is supposed to be protected. So when I, when I gave that matrix, you know, and I said we need to figure out how to protect the upper left-hand box of you know, professional content that's being copied completely, um, it's to recognize that's where the core right, uh, need to protect is, but to try to distinguish the other places where we shouldn't be exempt, uh, exerting um, uh, this kind of force. And you know, in some cultures, it doesn't sound like a big problem, but I, was, I gave a talk in, in, in China, and China, of course, is being pushed by the um, Americans in particular to become much more vigilant in their prosecutions. And the kid came up to me and told me about his brother who had been thrown into jail for posting a remixed song on a file server in China because he had violated the rules of copyrights so and he didn't have permission to be remixing the song. So, so the point is, the, the kind of subtle distinct, the kind of distinction you're arguing for and that I'm arguing for as well, just doesn't actually exist in the way the structure of the system is being pushed. Now, um, I, so how to, how to adjust the system? Well. I actually am not saying that we should have a, a system, this is actually a system described by my colleague Terry Fisher at Harvard, a system that says all copyrighted material gets dealt with in the way a collective, voluntary collective license or a collective license would deal with content. I think you know, we have to be um, minimal in, in the efforts to create special categories. And, and I, would, you know, I would actually say, all I'm talking about is peer-to-peer -peer file sharing in a non-commercial context. Um, we should compensate artists for that kind of um, activity, not by blocking the activity, but by figuring the right point in the network where it makes sense to tax and compensate in response. This is a familiar solution in Europe. Um, of course, the Europeans have been, you know, Europeans, for example, tax hard drives or uh, um, other devices like that in order to raise the money to pay for um, uses that aren't explicitly authorized. But the Europeans also cave into American pressure to make the activity also illegal. So it's not like it's legal to engage in the activities you're being taxed for your hard drive to do. You're both engaging in illegal activities and you're paying the tax. Now, I don't think we should do both. You should be free to engage in the activity if the system is taxing and compensating on the basis of it. And I think that for a certain category of this material, um, that's what the system should do. But that's not to say that every film should be accessible in this context freely. It's not to say that um, we give up the, the normal market structure for copyright in every context. It's just to recognize that copyright has always had a wide range of tools for producing incentives to authors, and we should be looking at the wide range in the context of digital technologies rather than insisting on a single model, a per copy-like control, which I'm arguing can't work, and to the extent it doesn't work but you continue to insist on it, has the extraordinarily bad consequence of producing a generation of criminals, who's, um, which is, you know, I think, actually a more important problem than the problem of worrying about the cost of, of piracy. Um, so, so it's, it, it, I don't think we're actually, from the way you frame the question, very far apart in understanding where the thing is that we need to be worrying about um, uh, and the need to encourage um, a kind of creativity in that space. And I would, would have thought when you first started your question that the gaming industry is a perfect industry to recognize the need to encourage that kind of participatory value creating by amateurs, right? So games are extraordinary economy, bigger than the music industry uh, in the United States that um, is produced by people for free participating in activities that create enormous value which gaming companies get to profit from. That's a fantastic economy of creativity and the one that I'm describing here. Uh, um, and it, 
it doesn't come from the effort to exercise, I mean, in the broad mix, the kind of control that I was criticizing. My name is Max Anderson. I'm a member of the Parliament for Swedish Green Project. I enjoyed this uh, presentation very much, and I think that there is a very strong intellectual case for formal copyright. But this is politics we're talking about here. There are, in many areas, problems that there is a very, very strong intellectual case for doing things in another way. But still, the political system is not able to act. To take one simple example, agricultural subsidies. There is a very strong intellectual case that rich countries should not spend a large amount of money on subsidizing agriculture. But still, most rich countries do. And that is a political failure. And I think that the intellectual argument for reform and copyright is one. The technical reality means that uh, going back to the 20th century is an impossibility. But will the political system be able to do what really ought to be done? Do you see any encouraging signs that we won't have political failure, but instead we'll have reform? Well, um, I accept one part of the question, um, which is a challenge to, to say exactly why this is an important area to worry about. Um, you know, I too agree with you about agricultural subsidies, but maybe rich countries can, countries can afford that burden. Why should we say we can't afford the harm caused by this kind of backward regulation of copyright? And, you know, for much of the, I've, I've written five books in this space. Until the fifth book, I had a very geeky kind of lawyer-like reason, which was it just didn't make sense of the law. But the fifth book, um, a book called Remix, um, I wrote after I had uh, my kids. And, and what increasingly became salient to me was not so much the abstract question of the mix of incentives that culture produces, but the very real question of what was it going to be like to have my kids grow up in a world where what was normal behavior for them was presumptively illegal. And they were constantly told that normal behavior was presumptively illegal. And I began to have a kind of deja vu experience of my own youth spending time in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Republic saying, oh my god, all of a sudden it's just like it was back then in the sense that the people I respected and had the coolest time with, you know, the kids in the black market, these were the really creative kids in the Soviet system. You know, they produced all sorts of amazing stuff, all of it illegal, and they recognized their behavior was illegal, and yet they said, to hell with the state, to hell with the law, I don't care about it. And I you know, had this feeling that that was a very unhealthy culture within which to grow up, and I didn't want to see my own kids growing up in, in that way. Now, um, the second part of it, of your question, though, I think, um, really brings out why I was keen to come here and talk about this issue. Because you know, I've actually, in my own work, have moved away from talking about this issue much, and in the United States have begun to focus on what I call uh, kind of corruption, um, which is the way the American political system works now um, enables a kind of corruption in the open where financing of campaigns is so central to what members of Congress um, uh, uh, pay attention to that money inside the system can produce results that have nothing to do with the underlying good for the constituents that these, these people live about. And copyright was a perfect example of that. I mean, there's an extraordinary political power that the copyright industries have in the United States with no relationship to, to the sense of the position that they're making or the actual economic good of what they're talking about. And it was almost impossible in the United States to get progress in this space. Even if you had the best arguments, the arguments were irrelevant because it was the underlying economy of uh, influence spiced up with the fact that it's movie stars and you know, the most famous people in the world arguing in favor of this extreme form of regulation that made it hard to imagine doing anything differently. But I don't think that same kind of corruption exists in all political systems in the same way. And 
um, I actually think countries like yours um, have an opportunity to frame this debate in a broader way. So you could imagine having a debate where um, members of even your government could, could facilitate a, a discussion that wasn't conceived of as a discussion between music labels and film companies and libraries, but was conceived of as a discussion that involved the full range of society, educators um, and parents and industries, digital technology industries, all of whom were affected by this, and begin to think about what makes sense to structure this regulation in a digital age without being in the way that I think of the American political system right now, corrupted by the very strong vested interests that obviously exist in that culture and exist differently here. Um, so I, I think it's an important issue because I think it's a corrosive issue, the way it's being prosecuted vigorously everywhere. And I think it's an issue that is genuinely hard to figure out how to get the right answer as long as you don't accept either simple solution, which is either get rid of copyright law or just enforce the copyright law the way we did in the, in the 20th century. Um, and so I think what's needed is creative legislative solutions. So the Green Party in Germany, for example, has a fantastic um, cultural um, uh, uh, collecting, uh, I don't remember the name, uh, the translated name of it now, um, but it's basically a, um, it's a, it's a, a system to raise money to allow file sharing and stuff to occur, but compensating the artists through the, uh, the way that I described um, a collecting society, a, a um, um, voluntary collective licensing would do it. Um, and their reason for developing this alternative is to decriminalize the behavior that all the kids are engaging in, yet securing compensation to artists. That's a position that no political party in the United States could advance. Couldn't even mention it because the interests in the United States are so effective at stifling any real debate about how to make the system different. Um, so this is a debate that requires people from around the world to participate who are not so vested, tied up with the existing system. And, and I think this country is a perfect one given the character of the debate in this country between you know, obviously a party, the pirate party whose policies are sensible even if the way they frame it to an American ear sounds a little crazy, but I think you know, at least has pushed the debate in this culture in a way that makes it a fertile ground to have a genuine inquiry as, a lo as opposed to the United States where I don't think it's possible to have a useful inquiry about this question. Uh, my name is Matthias Persson and I'm a chairman of Open Channels in Sweden Association. And we have been using uh, Creative Commons and public domain for a long time now uh, in our public access network channels. Uh, but we have one problem. It's this Creative Commons thinking is, as I see it, a lot about commercial or non-commercial use. But uh, in our uh, local TV stations, there are a lot of groups that are broadcasting because the freedom of speech, and they have some of them are to the left and some of them are to the right. And maybe, for example, the, the song you played here, uh, Our, My, My Life, or, yeah. Yeah, uh, say that uh, it's a creative common uh, song, but say that ex so a party, extreme right-wing party, would like to use that song in, uh, in a, a TV show. Is that okay or can the, this boy who made the song stop that? Yeah, this is a very difficult question. Um, and um, it can be framed as a question of copyright or it can be framed as a question of moral rights. And obviously different countries have different levels of protection for moral rights, even though we all try to harmonize our protection for copyrights. Um, and uh, I, I don't, the Creative Commons license doesn't try to change the moral rights claim that one can make. And so in countries like Japan, there's explicitly in the license a, a technique to deal with moral rights-like claims when somebody is using a work that conflicts with the creator's conception of how the work ought to be used. Um, from my own tradition, from the American tradition, I don't think that the, I don't think it's sustainable to imagine giving people the control over how the work gets used in that way um, or giving them the legal control. 
Um, so, you know, there's a distinction between saying you ought to be able to sue somebody because of the way that they use your work and saying you ought to be allowed to criticize them for using the work in, way they, in the way they use it. Um, and I, just given the traditions in America and the First Amendment's uh, influence, in fact, there are a lot of contexts where you don't have the power to sue even though you have a perfect power to criticize. So, for example, with defamation, the Supreme Court has read a very strong First Amendment protection into def defamation law that says that basically if you're talking about a public figure or a matter of public import and you defame somebody, as long as you didn't really intend to defame, like know that you were defaming, you're free of legal liability. Now, it doesn't follow from that that you're free of being criticized. So if you write a newspaper article that you know, says somebody is having an affair and you were negligent in doing that, you might not be able to be sued for it, but you can be punished in the sense that people say it's a terrible newspaper or people say you're, you're you know, terrible to be so reckless about it. So I think the point is to recognize we don't need the law to be regulating in every sphere of our life and we don't depend upon the law to regulate in every sphere of our life. And there are lots of places where we just have to admit the law can't do any good and rely upon other devices like social, social norms or uh, uh, social expectations to deal with that kind of problem. And so in the context that you raise in particular, um, I don't have a lot of sympathy for people who want to use the law to stop people using their work for a particular political reason. Um, um, you, know, I, I, you know, I write books. People quote my books in all sorts of contexts that I hate. Um, the idea that I would have the right to go and sue them because they're using my work in a way that I don't like seems to me absurd. Yet musicians all the time behave like that. You know, they feel like they have to affirmatively approve the context in which their music is being played. So if George Bush plays some musician's song, um, or this happened in the last presidential campaign, John McCain tried to use somebody's song and they filed a lawsuit against him. It's an insult to his dignity. I just think you know, artists need to suck it up and get used to the world where um, of, you know, exchange of ideas that we writers have lived in for a long time. Um, and, um, and I think that that is going to push towards deregulating in this space, not just in America, but, but in lots of contexts. Uh, my name is Shell Nielsen. I'm from the National Library. Uh, it's not going to be about music. Uh, we've been talking about legislation a lot here, but in the uh, library world, we've seen that the move from print to digital has entailed a move from legislation to contracts. And um, we have been a bit worried about that because contracts obviously override le legislation. How do you look uh, upon the effects of this development and how do you see the role, the changing role of legislation in this context? Well, I think that um, it's an extraordinarily serious problem that the, the culture pres preservation part of our world has got to pay more attention to. Um, um, I, I um, talk about this in another context by thinking about the contrast between books and documentary films. So the world that you've produced has basically made it the case that we can get access to any published book ever published. It's either in the public domain, so there are lots of copies of it, or we can move the physical book around. Um, uh, but essentially, this is, a, this is a architecture of cultural preservation that has worked pretty well to make it so that we have an extraordinary range of access to the stuff that's been published in the past. Contrast that with documentary films. Documentary films, like any film, are compilation works. So you've got copyrights to music inside it, you've got copyrights to stories sometimes inside it, you've got artist rights tied up with the film. Uh, and documentary films often you know, take clips that they include inside the film. So you do a film about civil rights in America, you might have 60 seconds from a news program in the film, or you might have 100 of those clips in the film. Well, the practice of cultural production for documentary films uh, in the United States at least, um, never presumed that they were allowed to use those quotes for free. They always thought they had to license them. So they entered into these licenses. And the licenses say, number one, you agree, you don't have a right to do this without a license. And number two, the license we're going to give you is a five-year North American educational distribution license. 
which means that after five years, you've got to go back and clear the rights to all of those little things that you've put inside your film if you want to continue to make it accessible, which means that for documentary films, the vast majority of them will literally turn to dust on shelves before anybody's going to be able to clear rights necessary to even make them accessible in the future because you can't even move it from a, uh, you know, the film base to the DVD base without clearing the rights necessary to re-clear the permissions to include them in a film. I, there's an um, ama amazing uh, American documentarian, uh, Charles Guggenheim, who was one of the most important political documentarians, and his daughter, Grace Guggenheim, also a filmmaker, has spent literally 20 years of her life trying to clear the rights necessary to make it so her father's films can be accessible on DVD. Um, now, you know, she's obsessed about it. 98% of the world is not. So this bit of culture is going to disappear just because people never thought through the ecological consequences of adopting one obsessive regulation-focused mode for controlling access to culture versus another. And my fear is libraries are walking down this path. Um, so um, uh, think about, you know, I told you the story of the Google Books uh, um, case, there's a settlement in that case, which basically Google says that they will make it, the settlement says that you can get access to 20% of the book for free, for this category of books in the middle, and then if you want to get access to more than that, you've got to pay for it, and then they'll distribute that money through some society that, um, that uh, allocates the money fairly to whoever should be getting the money. Um, now, that makes it sound pretty simple, but in fact, the rules about this are radically different depending upon the particular kind of work. And what you've got are these genius geeks, technologists, who are figuring this extraordinarily complex system for regulating access to these books. Um, and you've got an industry or booksellers or, I mean, um, uh, authors guilds or publishers who are interested in finding any way to get revenue. So they begin to carve up all of these works in a way that turns books into documentary films, right? The point is all of a sudden you don't have guaranteed access to this work because it depends upon your um, permission. I mean, I, I experienced this vis viscerally. My, I just had a third child and, and um, three days after she was born, there was significant fear that she had a very uh, extreme form of jaundice, which if you don't know, jaundice in this form can cause brain damage and, and be quite devastating. So um, we were increasingly fearful of it and at um, uh, a certain point the doctor said we had to rush her to the emergency room because he was convinced that she had this severe form. So we rushed her to the emergency room and I had printed out articles about jaundice and I'm sitting there trying to you know, wait for the doctor and reading this article. And here's an article by a science, science, scientist in a scientific journal that I was able to download the whole article for. And I get to the critical passage where there's a graph that's going to tell me whether my daughter faces some crisis or not. And the graph is not there. Instead, there's a little passage that says, the rights holders have not given permission for this to be distributed across the internet. Please consult the original copy in a library. And you know, this astonishing moment, like the idea that we're going to begin to carve up access to scientific journals based on whether you can clear the rights to a graph in the journal and then have the array of extraordinary complexity around that to guide our access to culture is a nightmare. And librarians, I think, have got to begin to help us see just how horrible that's going to be and to basically destroy access to our culture. Oh, the kid's okay. She didn't have that bad. 